Hello, this is Morel Bernard with the continuing story of A Christmas Carol. Do they know it is Christmas? A Christmas Carol. Last words were struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself. And please subscribe and please share these videos. Much appreciated. Again, the ghosts sped on above the black and heaving sea on and on, until being far away, as he told Scrooge from any shore, they lighted on a ship. They stood beside, the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. But every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath of his companion of some bygone Christmas day, with homeward hopes belonging to it. And every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had a kinder word for one another on that day than on any day in the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, and had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was the great surprise to Scrooge while listening to the moaning of the wind and thinking of what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognise it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with a spirit standing, smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Aha! laughs Scrooge's nephew. <laughs> if you should happen, by any unlucky chance, to know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humour. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he. And there assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, roared out lustily. (laughs) He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking (laughs) that he's ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. 
Scrooge's nieces, sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. I mean, what's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's knees. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges because they had just had dinner. And with the dessert upon the table, were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I am very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereat Scrooge's niece's sisters, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. Do you go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh, and as it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar, his example was on unanimously followed. It was only going to say, I was only going to say to Scrooge's nephew, that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I'm sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of him. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only put him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something, and I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge, but being thoroughly good-natured and not much caring what they laughed at, so they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment and passed the bottle joyously. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew what they were about when they sung a glee or catch. I can assure you, especially Topper, who could grow away in the bass like a good one, and never swell the large veins in his forehead, or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played, among other tunes, a, a simple little air, a mere nothing you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school as he had been reminded by the ghosts of Christmas past. When the strain of music sounded, all the things that ghosts had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more and thought that if he could have listened to it often, years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the section's spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played the forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty thunder was a child himself. Stop. There was first a game at blind man's buff. Of course there was. And I no more believe that Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. 
My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after the plum sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself amongst the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did on purpose, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have slided off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not. But when at last he caught her, when, in spite of all her silken rustlings and her rapid flutterings past, he got her into a corner whence there was no escape, then his conduct was the most execrable. For his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress and further to assure himself of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger and a certain chain about her neck was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it when, another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's buff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise at the game of how, when and where, she was very great, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls too, as Topper could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge for wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on that his voice made no sound in their ears. He sometimes came out with his guests quite loud and very often guessed right too for the sharpest needle, best white chapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood and looked upon him with such favour that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. Here is a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour. Spirit, only, only, only one more, one more. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must find out what, he only answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which she was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show-off, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a manager, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled, that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, I found it. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge. (laughs) Which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment though some objected at the reply to, Is it a bear? 
ought to have been yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. He has given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is, said Scrooge, his nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge, Uncle Scrooge had, had, impersonably become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, in jail, in miseries, every refuge, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast a door and bar the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night. But Scrooge had his doubts of this, because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his altered form, The ghost grew older, clearly older. Why not join me? Join me for the next video of A Christmas Carol. Do they know it is Christmas? Join me for the next video of A Christmas Carol. Do they know it is Christmas? With me, Morel Bernard. Join me for the next video. Until then, bye.